Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Connect In. It's really great to have you with us tonight. And boy, do we have some special guests for you tonight. We are very privileged to have all the way from Western Australia on the other side, uh, Commissioners Peter and Jenny Walker. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thank you, Andrew. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. We are excited to just spend the next few moments just having a bit of a chat with you guys. And um, it's been really good just having a, a chat with you beforehand about some of the stuff that um, you've been involved in. But for the people watching tonight, I was just wondering whether you guys would just like to take a few moments just to introduce yourselves for those of you, those that don't know you, you know, let us know who you are, what you've been doing and where you've been and all that sort of stuff. And that'd be, that'd be really good. I'm going first. Okay, Peter and I have been officers since 1982 and we officially retired on the 1st of April this year. So we're just learning what it means to be retired. But prior to that, we spent over 20 years as core officers in Victoria and over 10 years in Tasmania. We've served twice overseas. We did a term in Malaysia at the Kuching Children's Home. And more recently, we uh, were the territorial leaders in the Indonesia Territory. And we were there for over four years, which was a great experience for us. We uh, have two boys, two adult sons. They live in Tasmania, in Hobart. And we have um, four grandchildren, but we have another three that have come through another relationship. So in total, we've got seven grandchildren. Wow. Yeah, so it's been a bit difficult being disconnected from our family this year. We would have loved to have gone and seen them, but we're trusting God because we believe he's got everything in hand. Amen. Your turn. Well, what else is there to say? That was pretty <laughs> comprehensive. <laughs> yeah, we, we went into the training college back in 1980 as a married couple, so we were already married. Uh, we shared our whole experience as officers as being as married as a married couple, and uh, as Jenny said, it's been a huge variety of experiences for us. Um, you know, from way away at Bairnsdale in Victoria to Maui to Rosebud, um, over to Malaysia, and uh, back to Perth for a little while. So yeah, we we've, we've just had a wide experience, and we, to be honest, um, never regretted the call to officership or answering that call. And uh, just the uh, the amazing things God has, we've seen God do mm. over those years. It's been mm. a tremendous privilege and one we will, uh, well, we'll never regret, but also, you know, always be amazed at the hand of God in the lives of people. Yeah, well, yeah, you've certainly had a ride, haven't you? We have. Yeah, it's been great. Well, thank you again for, for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be blessed tonight as we, we listen to you guys. Um, we had... I was just listening to you guys before and um, about you were talking about in, in 2018, what you were involved in there. And could you spend maybe just a little bit of time talking about that, what happened and um, the rebuilding? We're sort of continuing with our Nehemiah sort of series and the rebuilding is was very in, uh, interesting to me as we're sort of looking at Nehemiah re rebuilding the walls. Maybe you can tell people about what sort of project you were sort of... Uh, face with overseas in 2018? Well, I'll let Peter do most of the talking, but as we were reading through Nehemiah, we were talking about rubble, the rubble of the Jerusalem wall, and we saw a lot of rubble in Indonesia in 2018. So I'll let Peter go from there. Yeah, at the end of September in 2018, um, Indonesia, which is where we were working, suffers from... Um, many earthquakes. In fact, it's part of what they call the ring of fire. Now, I think there are more earthquakes in Indonesia each year than anywhere else in the world. Oh, yeah. And on the island of Sulawesi, which is where the Salvation Army is very strong uh, in Indonesia, there was a, a terrific earthquake, um, seven point something on the Richter scale. And what made it particularly devastating was that uh, it was preceded by um, a huge tsunami, a wave that crashed into the city of Palu, which is the biggest city uh, there. And then uh, that was followed by 
uh, what they call liquefaction, which is where many areas of the surrounding geography literally turned to mud. What, what had been solid ground and villages suddenly became these fields of liquid mud that moved and swallowed buildings whole. Um, so it was pretty devastating. And to the Salvation Army, we, we had lost or damaged over 100 buildings. And it's almost too, too much for your mind to put aside. Something like 70 core. 12 schools. 12 schools, um, officers' quarters. Officers quarters. Um, just knocked flat and, uh, and unable to be used. So it, it, was a, it was a devastating mm. thing. 5,000 people lost their lives. Wow. And I, I just want to interject here. What, one of the core that was just decimated to rubble, uh, we opened in 2016. That core building took the core folk 13 years to build. Wow. They built it themselves. It took them 13 years. Another core building they had been building it. See, they're very poor, a lot of these people, so they, they just build a little bit as they can afford. This core building had taken them 16 years to build and was going to be opened in October, and then the earthquake just flattened it in September. They lost everything. Wow. Yeah. So, so we know what it's like to see rubble. And, um, I, you know, your heart just went out to these Salvationists who, who lost not their own homes, in many cases lost their own personal homes and, and also lost their core and their core buildings. And in many of the villages around that area, the whole village is Salvation Army. Like the biggest building in the town is the Salvation Army Citadel mm. or Hall. And some of them were massive. There are congregations there of well over a thousand people. Two thousand people, some of them. And um, you know, and that's many of those were flat. Yeah. So it, it was devastating. And uh, but we were we were just so blessed by the Salvationists. Firstly, they were the first lot out, trying to provide relief, food, help to other people. So they were terrific in their in their welfare uh, concerns for for the local people. And it didn't matter what religion you belonged to. Um, so that they were terrific. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, the very first thing they wanted to do was to rebuild their or some form of worship place. So right. even if they made them out of palm leaves woven together in sticks, um, almost within weeks of this, they were up and worshipping again, mm -hmm. uh, even before they rebuilt their own homes. So, you know, th they loved the Lord, they loved the Salvation Army and... Um, and, and they wanted to help other people around them. Um, and I, I, can't, I can't say enough about the way they supported each other and other core and financially, but with food and support. Um, we visited some of the sites mm. just a few weeks later uh, and saw, you know, they directed huge kitchens um, and set up water purifying areas and um, we're dishing out masses of rice and other types of food, and just feeding whole villages. Um, one it, wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, although we, you know, hearts broke for the people, um, and and support came in from other Christian churches all over Indonesia too to help them uh, to rebuild some of these places. So I would say by now, quite a few of these places have probably been rebuilt. The one thing that impressed me was the resilience of the Salvationists. And mm -hmm. resilience is that inner strength you have, that ability to bounce back when tough things happen to you. And their resilience was amazing. But as I stepped back from that and thought, uh, there's a verse in Timothy that's where Paul says, be strong in the grace of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, the strength came through the Holy Spirit it's God's grace that gives us strength. Mm. And, and we saw that. We saw, and it's almost a supernatural strength that God gives you in these hard situations. And we were just totally amazed at the way uh, the salvationists came through the tragedy. Um, in fact, we sometimes think, you know, it would be difficult for Australians to go through what they went through because they had nothing. They, had, they lost everything. 
and so many people died. And But they, I mean, as Peter said to you before, Andrew, the first thing they did was to set up a temporary Salvation Army hall. They didn't have a home to live in, but they set up a tent with seats, a mercy seat, and they were all there on the Sunday and they just wanted to worship God. So we were just uh, so impressed by the Salvationists and their faith in God in this situation. Setting up a, a place to worship and come together was more important than rebuilding their own places of, uh, of their own habitat. Um, yep. That really has to say something about their faith, doesn't it? It does. It does. And also, um, their, I guess, the sense of community that they have. Mm, yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned that sometimes whole villages thought of themselves as Salvation Army. We, like, we don't understand that here. But, mm. um, you know, so, so the centre of the village was, you know, the Salvation Army. And, uh, and, and I guess it helped them to feel that their community was coming back together if they could rebuild that. Um, and, and I guess if you think about it, um, a little bit of that sits in the story of Nehemiah, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of it does around about community and hmm. because Nehemiah couldn't do it by himself and he needed, he needed, he needed the, the tribe to help him and, um, yeah, very much so. Hmm. Uh, I guess, Andrew, also the sense that the, you know, rebuilding the walls of the city and re-establishing the city, um, you know, it's a bit the same thing. It's the, it was the centre of their faith. It was the centre of their culture and belief and, hmm. and the centre of their relationship with God. So they, you know, there was that real heavy sense that we need to rebuild this. So mm. yeah, we saw we saw that in action. Mm. So as as territorial leaders for that for that uh, disaster, uh, what what were some of your main priorities? Obviously, prayer as prayer was foundational for Nehemiah. We know that, and would have been for you guys as well. But mm. what what were some of the other maybe priorities for you guys? I mean. Hope in those times is very important. What, what did you do? Like, I mean, there was so much need, so much devastation. Like, where, where did you go? This is what we need to do first, and then we need to do this, et cetera, et cetera. The, the very first thing was when this happened, uh, we lost all communication with the whole area. There was the phone, all the phone towers were destroyed, um, and there was no way to even talk to anyone there. So, our chief secretary, who was a, a, an Indonesian officer, was able to hitch a ride on a military airplane and fly in uh, to, to the airport, which the airport itself was damaged and was closed to public flights, but they were using these special military aircraft, aircraft to get someone in. And so our chief secretary went in, he met with our divisional leaders there, and they started a food distribution um, arrangement. But all the roads leading into the key city of Palu and the local areas had been uh, blocked. So we couldn't eat, we couldn't get food in. The only way to get anything in was by airplane. And we started doing that. The, the Salvation Army had hospitals there. So uh, we were able to send in medical teams. We were able to send in some goods and supplies on those, on those air, aircraft. So that's the first thing we did. The other thing we did on the other side of that was to work with the International Salvation Army to try and raise some funds to try and purchase some emergency supplies and goods. And uh, we were able to do that. Um, and I want to take my hat off to international headquarters uh, and to Australia, let mm. me say. Australia was very generous. Yeah. So they support, very shortly after that, we had officers coming from uh, overseas from a number of different countries to help mm. us. And, um, and we were writing a request for um, support. Um, so I guess we, we spent most of our time uh, back at headquarters, at least, trying to rustle up support and help for the local people. And um, I'll never forget the day when our chief secretary rang us on, on the only phone that could be found in the city of Palu uh, to get a line. <laughs> he managed to. He managed to, to ring us, and uh, I mean they lost everything. There was no power. There was no. There was no water. There was no nothing. Um, and some of the key hotels were, were all damaged. Were just destroyed. And also, all the 
dignitaries in the city had all been meeting in a hotel that day and that hotel was completely demolished and they were all killed. So there was no leadership in the city. There was rioting, there was looting, looting. of stores. Um, it, 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 you know, as I reflect back on it now, they were desperate times. Jenny and I, our, our one thing we wanted to do was to actually visit ourselves and go and see uh, and meet with Salvationists, but that was impossible. We weren't allowed to go. Uh, for a few weeks. So I think it was about three weeks before we were able to actually go. And I went, not Jenny. Mm. It was really just too dangerous for Jenny. And I remember going to the scene of one core where it was just a, just the floor. That's all that was left, a tiled floor. And all the, all the walls had gone, the roof had gone, everything else. It was just a tiled floor. And they were uh, drilling holes through the tiled floor to erect logs and, you know, they were going to build this temporary core, I guess, on top of what had been the old core. And Salvationists had come from all over the area. There was probably 150 men um, all helping to do this. And uh, it was wonderful to share with them. But we visited a number of places and uh, it was great to talk to Salvationists. But they were so positive. I, I was nearly weeping for them, mm. uh, really. But they were so positive and they were getting on with their lives. And as Jenny said, the resilience was amazing. And I, and I think you see it in Australia when things like bushfires come and, you know, community disasters, uh, that spirit of, you know, getting together. But you'd like, and I, I do think that our Salvationists, because of their faith, um, they were just strong in, in believing that God was going to help yeah. them get back, um, I guess, to what had been lost. Mm. Amazing. It was amazing and an incredible privilege, Andrew, to have served in that place. Yeah, I bet you're going through college, you never thought you'd, you'd encounter no. something like that. Uh... <laughs> Absolutely not. No. There was no class for that one. No, no. No. Yeah, well. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot of sad, sad stories we could tell you, but we've only got a few more yeah. minutes. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I guess a key key uh, message through Nehemiah is this message of hope, and uh, that would have been key for you guys as well. Absolutely. How did you how did you encourage people? You you said that the Salvationists were very resilient, but but what sorts of things did you do to maybe encourage hope and sort of paint a brighter picture for the days ahead? Well, for me, the first thing we did was the practical help. I mean, people had nothing. They'd lost everything. They didn't have food to eat. They, they didn't have water to drink. But, you know, so the very basics of life. So mm. I guess the very first reaction is to, is to try and provide what people need to live. That's a solo so principle, isn't it? Well, it is. And, and, and to give people hope. Uh, because we were hearing from people that were trapped. There were a lot of, it's a very hilly, mountainous area. And there'd been a lot of landslides. And so some villages had been cut off completely and they were getting no help. Boy. So so we were, we, um, and I say we, I, I take no credit, our local leaders there in Palu were organising teams of people to go out on foot um, with bags of rice and, and the essentials of life and trying to get through to some of these remote cut off areas. Mm. Um, when we had the opportunity, uh, yeah, we, we certainly were able to speak words of hope Mm. Um, but but you know what I think in those circumstances actions count a lot more than yeah. than words. Wow. Yeah. And just sometimes I think your presence and being with them and listening to their story, that for them was healing and that was helpful. Mm. Um, other than that, there was wasn't a lot we could do except for the um, administration we did back at headquarters. Mm. We were very limited in that we couldn't speak the language, so we were. Uh, totally rel reliant on tr translators to communicate with many of the people. But as we said to you before, we um, took the general there last June and mm. had a congress and all the people came together and there were 17,000 people all turned up. Jeepers. In a football field. Now that's a congress. That's a congress. And do you know, <laughs> do you know, when the general spoke, Mm. He gave his appeal, and I tell you, 
hundreds of people, hundreds just ran to the front, hundreds of them. To give their hearts to, give to their Jesus. Hearts to Jesus. It, it was. Like, it's. And these are people who've lost everything. You know. They ran. Game. We could see them running every direction, just running to give their hearts to Jesus. We, we were incredibly privileged, Andrew. And. Um, and, and we saw God's hand in so many miraculous ways. You know, people were saved miraculously, physically, yeah. um, but also spiritually. Um, yeah. Mm. It's incredible that, you know, for people that have lost everything, but then have gained everything for accepting mm. yeah. the Lord as, as their saviour. Yeah, powerful. Those, those images will stay with you forever. They will. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Andrew. You've alluded to a little... We've never lost Nehemiah, haven't we? <laughs> Sorry. Look, um, you know, I, I was meant to talk about covenant tonight, but I'm, I've been completely uh, led by the Spirit here because um, I think I, be I believe that he wanted us to talk about this stuff because, um, yeah, I mean, it's on, on track with the rebuilding sort of theme. So, um, yeah, no, it's, that's, it's been really good. You alluded to some of this before, but the support from the wider Salvation Army, how did you find that? Oh, that, that was incredible. It, it's, it's, it's one of those things where um, when, you, when you're sitting in a, in a, I guess, a headquarters type role like we were, we got to see firsthand the responses from other territorial leaders, including Australia, I need to say. Australia was very generous. I mean, uh, Tens of thousands of dollars, I think, from Australia came in immediately, uh, but from many other countries and the other and even countries where, you, where we know the Salvation Army is not very strong and doesn't have access to huge resources. And yet, you know, they were sending money through to us um, and offering even more uh, to mm. kind of support. So it was very humbling, actually, Andrew, and it is good to know that you're part of a a wider Salvation Army, Army family. Um, There's some territories in the world who we know are mission support funded, who we know struggle financially, and yet they were some of the first to take offerings and send them to Indonesia. Wow. And that's their service to the Lord. I mean, it's very, very humbling to see mm. and to know and just to realise that their devotion to God is so deep that they would give to help another territory in a, in a dire situation as Indonesia was at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were very humbled when we saw the support that came from all around the world. And the internationalism of the Salvation Army is a gift from God mm -hmm. and we need to cherish it. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Holy Spirit is alive and active and working through the army around the world. Amen. And we just thank him that we've been able to see that perspective, that view of the Salvation Army. Yeah, you might know Drew Ruffin. Yes. Drew, Drew Ruffin headed up um, a team of people that came uh, from around the world, actually, um, and actually went into the city of Palu and over, uh, provided some oversight to our work there as we were trying to help uh, people in the communities around us and the work that we were doing wasn't purely for Salvation Army people it was no. you know it was it was to basically to anybody in the community in need um, there was some terrific work um, how, how do you think how do you think I mean fast forward the the clock a, a few years how, how strong do you think the the universal church is now uh, because of this tragedy uh, well, Christianity was quite strong on the island of Sulawesi, and but I don't see that this will have weakened it. Quite the opposite. I think this will have actually strengthened our salvationists, um, made them more aware of how much they need each other, how much they can support each other. Mm. And, um, well, as Jenny said, the fact that 17,000 of them would travel, many of them would have travelled days on foot to, mm. to come together to meet the general. Mm. Um just, you know, there's a spirit there, isn't there, of yeah. of wanting to be together uh, mm -hmm. and wanting to feel supported. I, I, I think the army actually is quite alive 
and strong in that area. Mm -hmm. And it will be in the future. Yeah, great. So for people watching at home, maybe thinking um, what they can pray for, for Indonesia, what, what would you say? Well, I think we need to continue to pray that God would release resources. Um, yeah. And that is an issue for, for countries um, around the world. Although um, the territory is self-sufficient, but there's a, there's a lot of need that arises um, when tragedies like this happen. Mm. Yeah. Just the, the, for that resilience, I guess, as well, that you spoke about. That's right, and and um, I think there's a need there's a need for um, officers to officers. to lead mm -hmm. uh, in Indonesia. So to, to pray for cadets and candidates. Um, Although last year when we left, we had over seventy candidates wanting to go to college, and we right. had to turn some down because we couldn't fit them in the college. Wow. <laughs> What a great problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a problem, but... Um, yeah, but there's still yeah. a great need for officers, but, but yeah. It's a, it's a big army in Indonesia and they do need officers. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll definitely pray for them. And um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's been great to just listen to your experience and the, the rebuilding of of uh, what's been, what was happening over there at that time. Of course, we don't know how the COVID-19 is affecting them, although a few weeks ago, 39 of the cadets and the officers were all in hospital with the virus. But thankfully, they've all fully recovered from what we've heard. Yeah. Um, and because yeah. the territory has six hospitals, they're, they're right at the front of what's happening with the virus. And we did hear that one of our nurses had died with the virus. So I think just uh, pray for the, the people who, and especially the hospitals, and there's 17 medical clinics. So some of our nurses and doctors would be right at the forefront of what's happening with this virus at the moment. I'd say our, we're now Australian. <laughs> we're yep. retired, but our heart is still there with the people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it's hard to imagine how uh, COVID would be going over there, you know, with, with the limited health healthcare and, and whatever. So they need our prayers wrapped around that as well. Thank you. Folks, our time is, is almost gone. I told you to go quick, didn't I? Yeah, um, yeah we don't um, seem to talk about Nehemiah very much. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think we have actually uh, in a roundabout kind of way. Um, is there some some final word that you'd like to just we, we we normally wrap it up by sort of giving people an opportunity to share one last final thought or an encouragement or something you've learned through the whole experience where you saw look, it work? Look, just from me, I've lo I love the passage in Nehemiah mm -hmm. where the people all come together and the priest and the prophets read the read the word to them and it says that explains it to them. And, and then goes on to say that they did this because the people had been weeping, that they, they encouraged them to rejoice because the people had been weeping. Mm. And uh, that sense of, you know, bowing before God, mm. hearing what God wants of us in our lives, and then really responding to that. Yeah. Um, it was quite challenging to me, actually, to read it. Mm. And, and to say that we do need to do that, don't we? Like, we need... We need to be studying the word, to explaining the word, teaching people about Jesus. Yes. Um, and I think we can get very distracted as salvationists into other things. Totally. But, but we, there's a part of us, you know, those of us who are in the priesthood, at least, if you, if you want to use that term, mm. really need to make sure that we're, mm. we're sharing the word about Jesus. It's so yes. precious. Yeah. And, uh, and I congratulate you, Andrew, on the great work you're doing and um, you and Diane and uh, just sharing the word through the way that you've had through modern technology uh, that we have available to us. Keep, please keep doing it, brother. And uh, God you. is going to bless the word as, as you yeah. share it. Yeah, and I, I say thank you. Nehemiah 8 has, has been my favourite chapter for many years. In fact, our ministry has been based on this fact that we need to teach 
and explain the word of God, to make it real, to make it relevant. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Yes. And uh, our, the Bible wants us, to, says, you know, we're supposed to grow uh, in grace and knowledge. We, we're to go from glory to glory, from strength to strength. And we're on yes. this journey and we need to develop our relationship and allow the Holy Spirit to do this rebuilding in our life. Mm. Uh, and it all happens around the word. And we could speak mm. more about that, but we haven't got time. Mm. So thank you. Um, we need mm. to keep teaching our people the word. Yes. Explaining the word, making it relevant to them, relevant yes. to our times. The gospel is a simple message. It's not complicated. True. And, True. Um, you know, it's, it's alive. The word of God is, is alive. It, it's a living thing. Mm. And uh, the breath of God just speaks through the word and it, it challenges people, it changes, it transforms them. It brings deliverance, it brings cleansing. Yes. So congratulations, mm. Maul and yes. Cor. We congratulate you on what you've been doing and we pray in the name of Jesus that God will just bless your ministry online. Thank and you. I know he's going to. Mm. And mm. that you will see much fruit from what you're doing. Yeah, thank you both. And the final word for you, Andrew, is simply to say that you need to know that your friends in Western Australia are aware, you know, things are not good in Victoria. You, you're very mm. restricted in what you can do. But, but we've been praying for you. You're not alone. Thank you. So, uh, we love you guys and, uh, and all of you in Victoria. We, just, we can't wait along with you for your, your restrictions to be eased. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words and encouragement. And thank you for giving up your time to share with us. Um, I've been blessed and I know our tribe will have been, been blessed. And uh, thank yeah, just thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Good. Have a great night and bless you both. And we'll, we'll catch up with you very shortly. Okay. Yeah, bless you. Bless you, Andrew. Bye. Bye-bye.